say evening at six o'clock on YouTube will be the kid zone for the children. And then at half past seven, the Bible teaching, looking at 1 Samuel chapter six. And then on Saturday evening, also on YouTube, is Bible teaching on this occasion, Jack Hay has prepared a message for us and that will be available again at half past seven on, on Saturday evening. And then next week, again, the gospel will be preached at half past six. We're not entirely sure who the speaker will be. We're waiting to hear back from Nigel as to whether he will be able to come on that occasion. So shall we just commit our time to God in prayer? Our gracious God, again we come in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ and we would indeed thank thee and praise thee that we can come together in this way to read thy word, to consider the glorious message of the gospel, to consider the good news of a full and a free salvation that thou hast made available through the person of thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We would look to thee now for thy help as we read thy word together, as we Consider what it would teach us. We pray that we may know thy Holy Spirit speak into our hearts. Those of us who know the Saviour, we pray that he may be more precious to us. For any who do not know the Saviour, we ask that it may please thee that tonight might be a night of decision when they will bow the knee and enter into the joy of thy salvation. So we Look to thee, we seek for thy blessing now in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And we want to read this evening from the book of Acts and chapter 4, please. Acts chapter 4. The background really to what we're going to read is in, the, in chapter 3 of Acts, at the beginning of the chapter we read of how Peter and John went up to the temple to pray. As a result of that, as they were going there, they saw a lame man. A man of over 40 years who was laid at the gate of the temple every day. And they had healed that man. At the end of chapter 3, we read of how Peter explained to the people what had happened. And when we come to chapter 4, the rulers of the Jews took Peter and John, they put them into prison overnight. And the next morning they bring them before the council. And we just want to break into the passage at verse 8. Acts chapter 4 and verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done unto the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him that this man stand before you whole, this is the stone that the, which was set at naught of the of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And we know that the Lord will bless the reading of his word. It's really verse 10 that we want to concentrate on this evening and concentrate our thoughts. However, as we think about it, we do need to understand and recognise that what Peter says, the, the force of what Peter says in verse 10 is underlined by the words that we read at the end in verse 12 of this chapter. Neither is there salvation in any other. This isn't an option, or what we're here tonight is not to tell you some option. You know, we're in a world where time and again we are told 
There are many ways to go. There are many ways to get to heaven. There are many ways in which men and women could know salvation, could know some form of peace with God. God's word is absolutely clear. It leaves us in no doubt. And the verses we have read tell us clearly that as far as God is concerned, there is no other choice. What we are going to look at tonight is the way that God has provided for men and women to be saved. And so the verse we want to concentrate on, verse 10, it starts with those words, be it known unto you all. We want you all to know. God wants you all to know. Peter wanted the people who were listening to him to know. We want the people to know. But as I say, fundamentally, the important thing is that it is something God wants us to know. This is not a question of a possibility. This is not something that is open to question. You know, very often again, as we, talk, as we talk with people around us and we talk about the things of God, there are many people who will tell you, I hope to go to heaven. I hope to, I hope to be all right when it comes to death. I know perhaps today there are people who will say, well, yes, there's nothing after this life. But there are still many people who recognise that there is something beyond this life. And they hope that they are going to be all right. Sadly, I can remember some time ago having a conversation with a lady as I was out with a gospel trap. And I can remember speaking to her about the salvation of God, about the Lord Jesus Christ. And she just turned around and said, well, you know, I hope I'm going to heaven. I go to church every day, every week. I read my Bible. I do good. I don't do bad things. I said to her, but God tells us in his word that he wants you to know. Here we have it be it known unto you. We could turn to John writing in his first epistle in chapter 5 and he will say, these things have I written that you might know that you have eternal life. And so the first thing we want to emphasise this evening is the fact that God wants us to be certain. We don't want it, it's not a question of leaving us in any doubt. God wants us to be certain about the way in which there we can be saved. He wants us to be certain because we all need that salvation. We said the background in these verses was a man who had been unable to walk and he'd been healed the day before, in the afternoon before he'd been healed by Peter and John as they went up into the temple. And you might say to me, well, that's all very well, but I'm quite healthy. I can walk. I haven't got a problem. My friend, God's word gives us some of these incidents as illustrations. And what God is illustrating in that is, he's left this on record to illustrate the fact that every one of us in the sight of God is lame in this sense, that we cannot walk in a way that satisfies God. Paul is very clear about this when he writes to the Romans in Romans chapter 8. As he goes through there, the, the the ways of God, he comes in Romans chapter 8 and he says at the end, he says in verse 8, 
So, they de so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. As is explained in the earlier verses of that chapter, that there is this choice. Either we live in the flesh, that is our natural life. And as you go through the Bible, the natural life is a life that is lived in bondage to sin. Romans chapter 5 will tell us, by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So death has passed upon all men, for all sin. Romans chapter 6 will tell us about the bondage of sin, and how we can be set free, and the only way to be set free. Are we going to think about that as we look at this verse, the only answer? is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, it may be. It may be that we are not like this man was in a physical sense. But of all the things that happened, of all the things that could have been recorded, of what the apostles did, this was recorded because it has a lesson for every one of us in terms of our spiritual and our moral standing in the sight of God. We cannot please God. God's word is absolutely clear on that until there is a change in our life. And how is that change effected? How does that take place? You know, as we look at the rest of verse 10, it tells us three simple facts that are central to the gospel message. First of all, it tells us of the person by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Here is the only answer. As we go through the Bible, it records the history of humanity and our, our very calendar is divided by the coming of the Lord into this world. Up until that time, and the Old Testament will record that history, for those thousands of years, man had lived. God had given his word, God had given commandments. God had told man what he expected from them, in many different ways. Yes, he gave them commandments. He gave them a conscience and... As we think about that, you know, it doesn't matter where we look in the world, there are things that people in virtually every society will recognise are acceptable or are not acceptable. We may have some variations as to the degree to which we take things. But in general, for example, in general, it would be recognised that to take someone else's life is something that is wrong. It would be recognised typically that taking property that belongs to someone else, stealing, is wrong. Why? Why? Because God has written his law on the hearts of men and women in what we call conscience. Yes, his word then tells us, and his word outlines in detail the standards that God has for this world. But you know, the one characteristic of the Old Testament is this. As we go right through that, wherever we look, the characteristic that is true in every case is this. Man cannot keep. God's commandments. I don't suggest that anyone here in this hall tonight, probably few if anyone who will listen to this message later, has ever killed another person. But equally, 
few, if any of us, could ever say that we have never taken something that didn't belong to us. Oh, it may not be, we may not have robbed a bank. But even the youngest children will know what it is to be told by their parents not to take something. And they take it. That sweet, that biscuit, that cake. You know, is there anyone here? who has never done something of that nature in the whole of their life. And you see the problem is, in the sight of God, sin is sin. Whether it's something big, like taking someone's life, causing somebody injury, robbing a bank, <laughs> Or whether it's something little, like taking just that biscuit that wasn't yours to take. Like telling that lie to cover up for something you've done. In the sight of God, that is sin. To such an extent that when we come to Revelation chapter 21 and we read there of those who are shut out of the eternal life and the blessings of God for eternity, there in that list of sins amongst the other things that we could have listed, at the end of that list comes the words, all liars in Revelation 21 and verse 8 all liars have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death all liars those who are those who are inveterate liars who can't help themselves Those who have got themselves into a position by deception and lies. Or those who have just found themselves on another occasion in circumstances where they feel the need just to tell a lie or a half-truth. Just in order to, get a, to escape from some situation they've found themselves in. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what character the lie took. Every liar has their place in the lake of fire. And the only answer is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He's the one who came. You know, we're coming up, aren't we, to the Christmas and we all remember the words of the angels that first day announcing the birth of the Lord Jesus for unto you is born this day in the city of David a, a saviour which is Christ the Lord John puts it this way in 1 John chapter 4 he says the father sent the son to be the saviour of the world and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ is the one whom God has sent but as we look at the last bit of verse 10, it brings to us, it brings to us first of all the reaction of men and then the answer of God to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. What did people think of Jesus Christ of Nazareth? What did they do? And verse 10 says, whom ye crucified. You say to me, well, that was 2,000 years ago. How does that apply to me today, my friend? When we look at the cross, every one of us has to come to that place 
and see ourselves in the light of what took place there. We have to make a choice as to what that cross means. From men's side, they crucified the Lord and the words that they used were these, away with him, let him be crucified. In the words of a parable that the Lord Jesus tells in Luke chapter 19, they said we will not have this man to reign over us. They didn't want him. God has sent his son to be a saviour, they said we don't want him. We've got no place for him. So if that was the case, I would if that was the case with me, I wouldn't be here today, my friend, sadly. That is not true. I was quoting just a few minutes ago the talk I had with a lady in the street a while back. She went to church every week. But, as far as her life was concerned, she made it very clear in that conversation that she had no place for the Lord Jesus in her life as a whole. She was quite content to give him an hour on a Sunday morning when she went to church. But she left him alone. And she wanted her to leave, she wanted him to leave her alone for the other 167 hours of the week. And that, that in principle is true of hundreds of people in this country today. They're quite happy to give place to the Lord by coming to a place like this, to some other place of worship for an hour or so on a Sunday. And they think that that will satisfy God. What they're saying with that is we don't want this man in our lives. We don't want him to reign over us. In effect, they are joining with that crowd who stood there in Pilate's judgment hall and said, away with him, let him be crucified. God is not looking for an hour, two hours, three hours of your life. God is looking for the recognition and the acknowledgement in his sight that your sin leaves you corrupt and defiled as a sinner in his sight. That your sin is hateful to him. And that you, if you want to be accepted by him, you need to have your life, your whole life, transformed. Christianity is not just a society that you join to go when you please and where you're doing something to try and gain favour with God. Christianity is recognising that you can never Satisfy God. We were thinking this morning of the words of Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1. He says you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from the vain conversation received from your fathers. You weren't delivered from your past life by the best that this world can offer. All the silver, all the gold in this world could never satisfy the heart of God. The Lord Jesus puts it another way, recorded in the gospel, in various Gospels, 
What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? My friend, you can have everything that this world gives you. And if you could gain everything, if you could accumulate everything this world offers and present it as an offering to God, it wouldn't be enough to pay the price of your sin in the sight of God. But the wonder is this. If the action of men to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and to God's salvation that he offered was to say away with him, let him be crucified, the answer of God was to use that act as the basis on which he could deliver men and women from their sin. And so the end of the verse says, whom God raised from the dead. And my friend, there is the wonder. Men said, we don't want him. Men said, get away with him. God says, there's a place. The highest place. The highest place in creation belongs to that one whom men rejected. He's worthy of the greatest glory. Again, Peter in 1 Peter 1 puts it this way. God hath raised him from the dead and given him glory. And so the challenge comes to you and to me today. What are we going to do with this person? Men said, the world said, away with him, let him be crucified. You know, Luke and John, both record of the cross, that they wrote a title over the Lord in the letters of Hebrew, Greek and Latin. Hebrew, the language of the religion of the day. Greek, the language of the wisdom of the day. Latin, the language of the power of the day. Every sphere of society in picture joined to pronounce its verdict against the person of the Lord Jesus Christ away with him. That's what God is telling us. God has answered that and said, no, I give him the highest place. And the challenge comes to you and to me tonight, what are we going to do with that person? What will we do with the Lord Jesus Christ? It's a question that was asked to Pontius Pilate. And Pilate, when he ordered the death, the crucifixion of the Lord, Pilate conceded to the wishes of the people because he was afraid of what the Roman emperor would say. We've quoted Revelation 21 and verse 8. We've said about the list in there of those who have a part in the lake of fire. And we've said about all liars there. The first in that list is fearful. Pilate had his place amongst those in the lake of fire because he was afraid of what his emperor would say. He put, he put the thinking of other men ahead of what God said. There'll be people, there'll be people who are afraid to admit that they're sinners. What will other people think if I say I'm a sinner and I need to be saved in the same way as a murderer or a thief or a con man? or whatever else it may be that you say. Maybe it's a fear of how we appear in the eyes of men. Maybe it's a willful rejection that someone will turn around and say, well, you know, I'm not going to believe because I don't think I'm that bad. God's word tells us clearly 
all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is a Saviour, one Saviour, neither is there salvation in any other. There's only one Saviour, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one way in which we can be saved when we recognise our sin is shutting us off from God. And when we turn from our sin, that's what the word repentance means that we read often in the book of Acts. Repent, we turn away, we make that choice that we want to turn our life round and we turn from ourselves and our efforts and our sin and we turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and we lay hold on him. We put our life into his hands. We allow him to give us that new life by the Holy Spirit. We quoted Romans 8. Romans 8 gives a contrast between those who are in the flesh and those who are in the spirit. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God because they're living in their own strength and it will never satisfy God. Those who are in the spirit are those who have turned from their own efforts. Receive the Lord Jesus Christ as Saviour, being born again by the Spirit of God and empowered in that new life to live for the praise and the glory of God. My friend, what will your choice be? Will you go your way? Or will you turn and recognise the salvation that God has given? and bow to the Lord Jesus Christ and receive him as Saviour and as Lord. Shall we pray? Our gracious God, again tonight we thank thee and praise thee for the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank thee, O God, that while thy word would tell us that there is no salvation in any other, we thank thee too for the assurance thy word would give us that there is no one who cannot be saved. He is able to save to the uttermost all who come to thee by him. We thank thee for the promise of thy word. And we just pray it might please thee tonight to bless thy word that there, there may be joy in heaven as sinners have turned in repentance. We look to thee and seek thy blessing, our Father, in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ.